Hello, it's Peter Wright and Kathleen Beauvais in Ontario, Canada, with another episode of The Yacking Show, the show that provides you with a wider wider range of actionable business tips than you'll find practically anywhere else on the internet. And don't miss out on our future guests. We've got a really exciting lineup coming along. So sign up for our weekly newsletter by going to the form on the bottom of our website, theyackingshow.com. First, let's introduce co-host Kathleen Bobe from Waterloo, Ontario. How are you doing today, Kathleen? Oh, I'm doing great, Peter. Thank you so much. We have a winter wonderland out there <laughs> today. We do. We just got lambasted with a lot of snow, but uh, hey, the sun is shining, so we're happy today. <laughs> So thank you all so very much for tuning in to our show. We so appreciate you and we love reading your comments. So please keep, we, we want to keep reading them. And if anyone is interested in being a guest on our show, don't hesitate to reach us at theyackingshow.com. All you need to do is click on the contacts tab where you will find a very short application form. We'd love to hear from you, as I said. And as Peter mentioned, we do have another special guest with us today. Her name is, and I love her name, you'll love it too. Her name <laughs> is Starlight. Hello, Starlight. How are you? Hi, everybody. I'm doing really well. Thank you so much for having me today. Good to see you. um, You are the founder of Bottled Lightning. This is a consultancy business that helps entrepreneurs launch programs. And today you'll be speaking about uh, how they can launch their own programs. But first, for our audience, can you give us a little bit about your background and what led you to leave the corporate world and start your own business? Sure. So I, uh, let's see here. I am a business strategist. I help online entrepreneurs, coaches, expert uh, consultants grow and scale their business with online programs. Sometimes that looks like taking their signature offer and making that licensable, uh, helping create a certification program around it, a training, training the trainers sort of program, or that really focuses on something that I like to call my specialty, which is community building. I help people who are trying to make the world a better place do it with the strength in numbers that is so valuable to people who are visionaries and trying to make the world better. Now, that ties back to my corporate career, where after many years in my career as a user experience designer, I had designed and built from concept to launch multiple ideas, software, technology, services on pretty much every platform and device out there. And I had gotten to the point in my career where I was working on an innovation team inside of a very large organization that was going to die if it didn't innovate. And this was a shift in my career that gave me a massive opportunity to take what people had really considered like a special quality of mine, right? Oh, Starlight, she's so technical. She's so creative. I thought it was an inborn quality. Working on that innovation team actually showed me that there are frameworks and methodologies for validating success, right? And taking it to a whole other level. And not only was I responsible for um, helping those teams develop those methodologies, but then implementing those methodologies across the organization. Now, why was this so interesting? My job, which I loved, was basically this company that needed to innovate or die had a list of ideas that they had collected from everybody in the company, from the CEO on down. Mm -hmm. Our job as a team was using minimal vi min minimally viable uh, methodologies, scientific testing, to validate whether or not an idea was viable. And viable in this particular context meant that it needed to have a business case that we could guarantee would bring in $5 million in recurring revenue annually. If we could prove that, take an idea, run it through some very small experiments, try some push marketing, et cetera, et cetera. If we could prove that, then we had a business case that we would give to the organization and they could implement and it was on to the next idea. So I was in this environment where I was essentially exploring new startup concepts almost every week, right? And in that process, it really gave me a, a skill set that I absolutely loved. Well, at the end of the day, I realized uh, there was a the leader, the VP of the innovation team needed to leave and the team wasn't going to survive without her. And I was at this point where I thought maybe I was going to become either VP or director of some sort of department or I was going to run my own startup. And I actually joined an accelerator and was working through some ideas inside of a startup accelerator. And I just couldn't commit. I couldn't bring myself to pull the trigger. And so I had like the 
corporate refugees uh, existential crisis and was like, who am I? What am I doing in the world? And I realized that my super talent is really about amplification. It's about taking something that's an idea or a concept or an impact or, or, a, or a product or a service and amplifying it, making it big, helping it go big, right? And I realized that at the core of what I was doing, I wasn't amplifying ideas and projects that my heart was behind. And so I decided instead of chasing a million, a billion dollar valuation and kind of getting into the startup world that I would take that and I would begin working with entrepreneurs who I really felt like I wanted to amplify their ideas. So here we are seven, eight, nine years down the road. And that's what I do is I, I work with visionaries and experts in their field to help them get amazing game-changing success using the talents that I acquired in this sort of corporate space and then uh, helping them take their message to the world in even bigger ways. What a wonderful wow. journey. What a journey. And and you, through all that, you went through another journey as well because uh, you are now <laughs> located in a much warmer part of the world than the north of North America, <laughs> making us really envious uh, having <laughs> spoken to you before. So it's a ter uh, we pride ourselves on having not only an international audience but inter a guest from all over the world as well. So tell our audience a little bit about where you are right now on the edge of paradise. Absolutely. So you'll find me right now uh, living the island life in an archipelago of islands in the Caribbean, just south of the Costa Rican border inside of Panama called Bogus del Toro. Um, I had realized uh, probably in my late 20s, early 30s, because I was living in San Diego for 10 years, another great place with really great weather. And for vacation, I would always go down into the Baja Peninsula of Mexico. And when I was down there, I would see all these retirees and these snowbirds who would come down for six months and enjoy living on the beach for a while. And I looked around and I was like, why do I have to wait until I'm retired to live right. this sort of lifestyle? And so one of the big changes I made in my life when I realized I could work for myself and I could work from anywhere was actually, I think I would love to live a life that's a little bit slower, a little bit more laid back. And um, I found myself in Boca del Toro. Wonderful. And the very fact you're talking on the internet with all the technical gear to run a business online all over the world it yeah. obviously has has the infrastructure for you to do that right yep yep you know i hadn't uh traveled internationally for when i was younger i remember having to call my parents collect from zimbabwe and africa and it would cost a minimum of 30 dollars just to call my parents yep. and i'd have to wait in line to use a pay phone and uh, i hadn't really traveled to other countries outside of Mexico in a long time. And so I had kind of separated travel into vacation. And it wasn't until I sort of had that epiphany on a Mexico beach that actually, I think I could do this anywhere. And I began traveling and going, what is my connection here? How is the Wi-Fi here? And we had gotten to the point where technology and access had really expanded. And so it was, it was, uh, you know, a slam dunk deal for me to go, you know what? I think I could do this anywhere. I'm going to go do it anywhere. Yeah, very good. Well done. Excellent. Are you making me, having lived in the tropics most of my life, now I'm feeling really envious. <laughs> yeah. I so, have clients who send me pictures of, from Canada with the snow and I get a full body shiver. At this point, if it's <laughs> below 75, I am freezing. <laughs> so, Starlight, I, we could talk travel all day, but um, for our audience, let's get, get on to some business things. So, tell our audience what you do as a, as a guide and amplifier for visionary entrepreneurs. Tell right. Tell us a little so, bit more about that. One of the things that that I think uh, it, it's not so much coming up with something new and doing something entirely new that actually makes growth sustainable or successful. It's identifying what's really working and putting in systems in place to make the things that work work even easier so that you don't have to work so hard to make them work and get results and finding opportunities to level up a situation. So kind of going back to the innovation days, my whole job was to take an idea and really map out the landscape of it. What's the experience like? What technology is being used? Um, what processes are in place? What is the customer experience of going through this process? Where are the obstacles and opportunities to take this experience and level it up? And that's really what I do with my clients. It's really about assessing where they are, Comparing that to where they want to go, because, mm -hmm. you know, living remotely from the Caribbean, I really believe that if we're going to go to all the hard work of being entrepreneurs, you might as well build a business that brings you joy and pleasure, right? Mm -hmm. It's hard enough to do it on your own. Let's do it when it's fun. So I take what they're doing and map it against where they want to be. 
and then draw the map and the roadmap that gets them from where they are to the results that they hope for so that they can inevitably work less and enjoy their life more. Wonderful. Excellent. Good. So- Kathleen, so, back to you. Starlight, what advice or tips would you have for entrepreneurs who want to take business to the next level but aren't sure what actions to take? I think the first thing, there's two parts. There's really assessing where they are and what's working, right? Making And then being able to be honest and vulnerable with yourself about what's not working because those are the things we're those are the things at the top of the list we want to fix we either want to get rid of them or find ways to remove them entirely and in some cases that might be hiring someone in other cases that might just be unnecessary suffering because the system isn't in place to make it easy but when we can compare what's working and what they're loving doing what's not working and then where they want to be a real clear pattern emerges on how they can actually begin taking steps. And so really the first advice I have and the first step that I work with many of my clients who are primarily focused on strategy Mm -hmm. is to do this really holistic assessment that isn't just an assessment of their business, but of their lifestyle as well, so that you can get a full picture of what we're going to make changes on and ensure that where we're going to make those changes is pulling the ship in the in the right direction for them at long term. Mm-hmm. So when you go through that process, what are some of the big obstacles that scaling entrepreneurs run into? That's a great question. So I think, you know, visionary people really are tough to tie down to a single concept without ideas, right? They're like, oh, but I want to do this thing. And I want to do that thing. And I want to do this other thing. And even though they may be saying like, okay, in the next five years, I actually want to be working less and scale back my efforts in this business and and see it thrive without me. They're not saying I'm done creating things and I'm done Mm -hmm. doing things. And so often what their personal struggle is between this desire to create something new and a commitment to what they've already built, whether that be serving their clients one-on-one or kind of burning out in the regular process. And so often the biggest obstacle is that they don't have time to step back and take this perspective from their business and begin focusing on priorities that actually make a difference for them long-term. I, I know as entrepreneurs, we can often get into this space where it's it's like you're just um, I know the the like I love Lucy episode where she's working in the chocolate factory. Oh. Like you're just trying to keep track of what's in front of you, and there's no real focus on what's coming or what what's ahead. It's just stay on top of what's in front of you, and that's one of the biggest obstacles for entrepreneurs who are trying to scale or even implement new ideas. Is that often what's in front of them is so fast and so much that they get lost in what's actually truly impactful, what what has a priority. And it's just like, if it's here, if it's on my plate, I've got to deal with it. And so that's usually the first place we start is go, what can we get off this plate? How can we slow down the process so that you actually have that space to think and be creative and imaginative about what's coming next for you? I'm going to throw in a subsidiary question that I need. <laughs> I thought of while you were talking. How often... <laughs> How often does ego become a problem when, you, when you're dealing with an entrepreneur who, who's perhaps quite profitable um, and has a big ego and it's my baby and I know what I'm doing, but I need some help? Is, does ego come into it? Do you have to fight ego I think, at times? I think, uh, I think most people who take on the mantle of entrepreneurship have some level of I can do this on my own. Like that's just part and parcel of who we are. Yep. You can't stop me. I'm going to do it. <clears throat> Right. So that's normal. But I think for people who understand they're at a stage where they actually need help, the ego ceases to be an issue because it's people who go, oh, I don't need help and I don't have a problem that like, all right, baby, if you don't have need help and you don't have a problem, keep on keeping on. But even people who have really well established businesses and have proven processes, it's not like I'm coming in and saying you're blowing it. Like, no, 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 we're just coming in and going, okay, what is it that you really want? And how can we make sure that everybody is pulling the ship in that same direction rather than all these disparate activities that are leaving you feel frazzled? No, good, good, good answer. Kathleen, thank you. (laughs) So what is an overlooked opportunity that business owners can use to grow? Uh, Let's see, an overlooked opportunity. I think that there's... uh, I think that there's this element of really seeing the results of where they're spending their energy 
and what it's getting them. You'll see this a lot on podcasts and and strategists doing it this at the beginning of the year. They're asking you, how did you spend your time last year? Mm -hmm. Uh, What did you spend your time that got results? What did you spend your time that didn't get results? What are you still looking at on your to-do list? This is a question I really like because we often get to the end of the year and go, oh my God, there was all this stuff I wanted to do. Okay, of that list of things you didn't get done, what did you do instead, right? And that's a tough question to ask yourself because you start to realize that the daily actions that you're taking in your business indicate your priorities, whether you've made them a priority or not. And so I think that's an opportunity really where people can look at how they're spending their time and being really honest about the results that it's getting and go, am I spending my time in the areas that I actually want to? Am I spending the time in the areas that are getting results? Or am I just, like I said, on that little hamster wheel, running, running, running and trying to keep up with things. That's really a core opportunity where just in looking at your to-do list for the last six months and what you accomplished and what you didn't accomplish is a really great data point, more or less, to go, okay, am I actually sticking to the things that I say are important in my business? Am I, or, or have I kind of let the machine get to me? Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's partly answered what I was going to ask you, which is what advice (laughs) would you, (laughs) what advice would you give to people, business owners, entrepreneurs who want to keep on growing their business, but they really, they've already had a preliminary talk to you and they realize they need to scale back the amount of time that they're investing in the business, but they don't, they don't want to, let it contract so there's it's almost yeah. sounds like a conflict of goals but you have a way around that so how do you help them do that yeah you know i think it's really most of the people who are looking to scale and take time off are starting to get signals outside of themselves that they need to do it their partner is like hey uh you haven't taken some time off in a really long time and you're acting real stressed when are we going on vacation mm-hmm. Or they're saying to themselves, you know, I can't work this hard forever. I can keep working this hard for what, five more years. And then I got to find a way out of this, but I don't really know what out of this looks like. And so often if they're at the stage of active burnout, it's a, we're we're dealing with somebody on fire that we need to put out, but Mm -hmm. active burnout is a different context from, I see this thing coming down the pike that I would like to change about my life. And so in that particular arena, it's not so much a, 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 a conflict as it is signals that it's time to start putting in changes. Mm-hmm. And so we're not looking at like something where like today you're working 20 hours a day and tomorrow we're down to four. Like all sure. change is gradual and will take its time. But we are going to look at your process in a really in a really specific way to identify where we can take your offers and make you not the linchpin of their success. Like if you're the only person that can keep your business alive, that's actually a liability for you as you begin to get into more experienced entrepreneurship. And so how can we replace the things that are amazing about you? How can we scale the things that are amazing about you? Not just in the context of hiring people who can do the things you don't want to do, but take what's inside of your head and put it into a system that can actually be scaled in a major way so that five years from now, when you see that time looming where you'd like to work on something else or where you'd like to take some time away from your business, you have systems in place so that you can step away and not need to be so actively Good. attentive to your business every day. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Good. If I were to call you up as a client, can you walk us through some of the steps that you would take with me to get things started? Sure. So I have three core core offers that I offer my clients. Okay. One is this sort of holistic next level strategy. I want to take my business to the next level. How do I do it? Another one is I have a really core signature offer that's been getting results. I need to find a way so that I'm not doing it all the time and working so hard because I want to sell more of it, but I, I can't see the path. And then the third is I know that there's an opportunity if I generate a community around my business or my offer or my or my concept what does it look like to actually scale my expertise and be able to reach a lot of people without working so much inside the context of a community so in all of those cases strategy is a little unique cuz we're looking at their business holistically but in the context of a signature offer and we're in the context of community we're going to dive deep into their customer experience that's where we're going to start right what is it that your customer journey looks like 
And most, most established entrepreneurs have a really clear understanding of their customer needs and problems that they're solving. But we're going to map that out into a journey that goes, maybe your customer is just getting started to in this concept today. And then down the road, they're complete acolytes and they're singing your praises. And maybe they're even teaching your methods to other people. What does that journey look like in regards to your offers, to your experience, to the transformation that happens in your customers' lives? And how do those things line up to the offers that you have, the courses that you have, excuse me, the content that you offer? How do those things match up? And that's our first place to identify where opportunities might be to modify your signature offer into uh, a system that can be scaled beyond that point or a community. And we can... By looking at the customer experience, really dive into how can we serve these people better or maintain the results that you've been delivering, especially if there's somebody who very who's very good at their job. How can we take that impact and make it available at a bigger scale? I, I, we want to keep yeah. delivering that impact, but we don't want to have to make you the only person who's doing all the work to do it. And that's where really systemizing your offer comes in. So some people mm-hmm. may have a signature offer that they don't realize it's a signature offer, but they've been, if you've been serving the same similar clients doing the same thing more than five times, you have a signature offer. Mm-hmm. The next question is, is that signature offer documented? Are there ways for you to make that signature offer easier to deliver the, the workbooks and systems behind it? How can we take those things and make them available in a grander way? It just, it really all starts with the customers and then identifying the patterns and then taking those patterns and expanding them. I know it sounds like a little amorphous, but that's, that's the bones of it. Excellent. All right. I usually start by asking my clients a ton of questions to get the lay of the land and their experience. And then we go from there. Excellent. So uh, what's the type of entrepreneurs you specifically work with? Mm -hmm. Tell our audience who you're looking, who would be your ideal client? What type of entrepreneur are you are you best able to help yeah so uh established entrepreneurs usually people who could be considered experts in their own right often these are expert coaches consultants uh thought leaders people who have written books and have podcasts and have this sort of they've created a lot of content they've created a lot of messaging that goes out into the world they have high ticket offers they know how to get business for themselves, because this isn't really like we're not working with trying to like um, you're not in hunger mode, right? Mm-hmm. At this point, you're trying to figure out ways to scale back yourself while still continuing to is a unique need that comes once you've really gotten it locked in of who I serve, what I offer them, and getting results. When those things are locked in, I often see that entrepreneurs will hit this stage of where, like, oh my God, the train is going. I love it, I love it, I love it, I love it. And then all of a sudden they're like, Oh my God, this is a lot. And I am, I don't have enough time and I'm traveling too much and I'm running ragged. Okay. That, that is usually the point at which when they're having that emotional experience inside their business, that's where we can walk in and go, okay, where can we take what you're doing and make it scalable without, uh, without you having to be the linchpin of the entire right. thing? Sure. Yeah. Okay. No, that's good. That's great. So here's a question that I ask. We ask all our successful guests, and you're clearly one of those. Mm-hmm. Uh, Starlight, in your mind, is there one characteristic or a habit or a mindset or even just a value that sets successful, I say business leaders, entrepreneurs and established business owners, is there something that sets the successful ones apart from those who remain average and never really make it, or is it more complicated? Um, you know, I think one of the, uh, this might be part of my personality. I don't know. Um, I'm going to tell a little tiny story if you'll allow me to indulge oh, myself. Sure. When I was little, I lived at the top of this hill. I'm, we're saying like three, three and a half years old. And there was, I we lived at the top of the hill and there was this very steep hill. And at the bottom of the hill, there was a freeway and there was lots of forest between where we lived and the freeway. And at three years old, my mom told me, don't go down the hill. Obviously there's a freeway down at the bottom. That would be dangerous. A little three-year-old getting lost in the woods. But in my three-year-old mind, the reason my mom told me not to go into the forest was because there were lions there. And I couldn't bear the idea that I might run into a lion and could convince it to be my friend. And so I'm James bonding myself down this little mountain 
jumping behind trees, looking around going, oh my God, what if I see a lion? I know, what if I see a lion? Well, it could eat me or it could be my friend. And I feel like that's a really characteristic mindset around entrepreneurship that is, there's lions, baby. It's going to be scary. Are you going to go down the mountain anyways? Are you going to are you going to face the trouble? Are you going to step out of your comfort zone? Are you going to let imposter syndrome hold you back? Or are you going to realize that every stage of your growth is going to confront you with uncomfortable feelings, with fears, with comparison paralysis, with all of these obstacles? We're all human beings, successful or no. We're all running into our little brain meat bodies, finding excuses to keep us from stepping outside of our comfort zone. And the people who simply accept the reality that outside of my comfort zone is my destiny, those people have a completely different experience in their business because the typical obstacles that we build inside of our own mind simply cease to be obstacles because I'm, I am i don't care, man, I'm going to go find lions, whether it eats me or not. Right. <laughs> yeah. Good. Oh, that's a, that's a good story. <laughs> what an excellent way to answer. Thank you. Yeah, for that. For sure. Very good. Oh. Excellent. So, so Starlight, let, let our listeners know how people can contact you because you work with people from all over the world. Yeah, absolutely. So my website is bottledlightning.co. And uh, my handle on just about everything is I bottle lightning. And on LinkedIn, you can find me under Starlight. There's not too many of me out there. And so uh, uh, you're welcome to DM me and connect any which way you please. And maybe we should mention what your last name is, um, because oh, I'm yeah, Mundy. Interested. Yeah, Mundy. <laughs> I All could right. tell you the story of my name as well. You know, everybody wants to know, like, is Starlight your real name? Okay, indulge me another short story. My mom was in labor with me, but she wanted to name me Lou, uh, Rainbow Starlight. And the entire time, my grandmother, who's very much a square from the 50s, <laughs> was like, it's too weird. She's not going to have any friends. You can't name her that. But my mom had really was like in her peak hippie era. She, my biological father was born and raised in a commune on Haight-Ashbury. Like she was just at this point in her life where outside the box was where she wanted to be, even though that might not have been her personality permanently. And so she decided to name me Lucinda Starlight. And Lucinda is a really significant name because it means leader of light. And it, and it was very valuable to her. But in that moment, she was naming me Lucinda Starlight in the hopes that eventually my last name would start with a D and my initials would be LSD. And she would usurp <laughs> my grandmother after all. But my name, but I've been called Star ever since I was a kid or Starlight by the time I got to college because I'm grown now. So call me Starlight. And uh, really, cops and doctors are the only people who call me Lucinda. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what fun. What lovely, lovely, lovely fun. What a great so, story. And, uh, we'll and, put those uh, contact details yes. on there. I'm going to jump in quick. We have a couple, We have two minutes to go. So no I'm going to ask Starlight, what advice would you have for our audience, business audience, looking ahead maybe five years because the whole business and economic and social landscape is disrupted between the virus, between recession, between inflation, between war in Europe. What's the most important thing business should be looking at going ahead now? You know, there's a lot that's changing in the world of AI and the tools that are being offered. There's a lot yep. that's changing in the world of technology. I think the biggest opportunity that business owners have at this stage in time is to not look at those things through the lens of fear. There's mm -hmm. lots of reasons to be concerned ethically around technology and such like that. But if your immediate response is to reject it, you're putting an inevitable obstacle in the path of your business that doesn't need to exist because you actually aren't sure how it might apply. And so if sure. your natural sure. reaction is to go, no, 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 that's not for me, without actually investigating the strategy or how it might be useful to you or how you could actually leverage it into something, I, it really circles back to that growth mindset. I think now more than ever, the ability to be flexible with how you see things being done and how you do mm -hmm. things is 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 an opportunity for people who are looking at the next five years going, what actually might change? And uh, how can I take it advantage of it rather than how can I cling to things that have always been this way? That, that's really a recipe for disaster any way you slice it. Okay, so concentrate on things like AI, AI not trying to make a better fax machine, right? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> it depends. You know, <laughs> I don't so, know. Uh, what, I don't know what fax innovations might be coming down the pipe. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Okay. Thank. Thank you very much, Starlight. That was what brilliant. an absolute pleasure to have had you on the show. Yeah. Starlight. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It was a delight <laughs> to be here. You guys are great.
<laughs> and thank you all once again for tuning into our show. And until next time, take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Ciao.